This is the Creation Gospel, the Spirit-Filled Family Series. We are back, and we are working on the segment of Creation Gospel Workbook 3, um, The Spirit-Filled Family. And in this section, we're addressing the Spirit-Filled Wives. Um, of course, it's impossible to, to hit all the themes that interest us in terms of the role of wives within the marriage, the role of wives within the congregation, uh, the role of wives within ministry. We all have questions about that. You know, there's great books out there. Um, if you have more specific questions about uh, the role of women within a congregation, the role of women uh, in ministry, and uh, in the workbook, There'll be some references in there if you would like to read more pointed things, but uh, that's not really my calling. Uh, I'm not an apologist. That's not, uh, I have had some courses in apologetics, but that's not really my gift. Um, I think my gift, if there is one, um, is to take that paradigm of the creation week and to help us put the big picture together. Now, sometimes that means we have to dig down in some details. Um, but ultimately, you know, when we finish a certain series, what I would like for you to, f you know, at least feel like is that I see the big picture now. I may still have some questions about the details. I might disagree with her here and here and here. Or maybe I just need to do more research in a certain area. Or she's really provoked me to do research in an area she didn't cover. You know, that would be a great thing if I'm actually motivating you to search beyond the material that we do have time to cover. Um, but hopefully by the end of the series, and, you know, we're drawing down now. Uh, we're on the downhill slide in, in terms of the, the content. Um, but, you know, I really want you to feel like you've got a good vision of the overall picture. And, and if we have a sense of, you know, the big picture then I think it gives us enough patience maybe to go back and, and dig harder through the details to answer um, more pointed questions that we might have. And I hope in the last program where we looked pretty intently at 1 Corinthians 11 and the instructions of Paul concerning a woman's head covering or whether a man should cover his head, um, and levels of authority and what it means concerning the angels, um, we could see that he's talking about physical things, visible things that can be viewed, but they're symbolizing things in spiritual realms, things we really can't see. Um, and which is more important? Yes. Because apart from the spiritual, what meaning does the physical have? And without the physical, what expression does the spiritual have? And so when Paul is writing about, you know, this sign on her head because of the angels, one thing we have to remember that maybe we didn't cover in the last program, we know he's talking equally as much about the Spirit, if not more, in that passage. It's, it's kind of a mysterious passage, but not really. Once we understand that in terms of the spirit, it, it talks about how it goes to and fro in the earth, looking for an opportunity to show itself strong on our behalf. Well, angels literally are messengers. They, they do missions. Um, I don't know if they do mission impossible, but they are definitely set, you know, into a mission. And so what Paul is saying, it's not just for the people in the congregation to see that this woman is operating under her husband's authority and with his voluntary attitude of submission, as much as with her voluntary attitude of submission, that in the spiritual realms, not just the physical, but in spiritual realms, these angels who are messengers of the spirit, because Adonai is a spirit, they can see that symbol. Now, it doesn't make her righteous. A pagan priestess can stick something on her head and it's a symbol. But by actually submitting to this practice of putting something on her head, it is a physical sign. Now, 
Can the angels discern in spiritual realms whether she is truly under the authority of her husband and Messiah and therefore the Father in heaven? Sure they can. But see, when they see this physical act of submission, just like we, we physically keep any commandment, it can be empty or it can be full of the Spirit. And if the Spirit is looking for ways to enable us, then the Spirit wants to inhabit that commandment. It wants to bring life and resurrection from that act of physical obedience. It's not just to do it for the sake of doing it. And so putting that sign on her head is not just putting a rag on her head for the sake of doing it. It's for a deeply spiritual reason to send that message to the angels that this is not a false sign, that I actually am in submission in all areas of my life. I am a voluntary cooperator with the Holy Spirit. I am a voluntary cooperator with my husband. We are in total submission and agreement with one another in terms of the work of the Spirit in our lives. And so please help us. Because see, if the angels help her, they are the messenger, they hear her ministering, then they are going to do things to enable her to bring that word forth. And the same thing with her husband. When he is obeying these commandments, which are actually coming out of Jewish law, from Paul, then those angels can also see, okay, this is a family who have the Yerat Adonai, the reverence of Adonai. And let us do what we can to clear the way in terms of an angel is a messenger. And if a message has been given to an individual or to a couple, they might have different roles in transmitting that message. One may be more of a mouthpiece, and one may be more of an administrator, a supporter, a promoter. They work together according to their gifts, their abilities, their personalities. And it's not a competition between them. They're a team. And so the angels see this peace within the home, signified by the sign on her head, signified by his acts of obedience, and wherever they possibly can, they are going to show themselves strong on behalf of those who love the Father. And so that's just one thing to keep in mind. It's, it's saying that we are not the masters of our own destiny that we actually submit our lives to the plans of the Holy One, whatever they are. So please help us. Because we know that there's principalities and powers out there that we really can't see with the physical eyes. Those mes messengers can see those things. And, um, you know, it's nice to think that when we're walking in the Spirit, that He does give His angels charge over us. Now, he doesn't countenance foolishness. We're not to tempt him and say, oh, there's an angel out there that'll help me and get me out of this mess. You don't purposely, like Yeshua said, you don't purposely jump off a cliff. You don't purposely jump off a building to make an angel help you. That is trying to force the hand of Adonai. That's actually a Judas experience where he's trying to force Yeshua into to declaring himself the king out of time. But in those cases where you have been submitted and obedient, you've obeyed, you've delivered, and you might be in a perilous situation, then those messengers, they know who you are. They know your name. You know, it's, it's funny. Some of the stories in Acts, they, they really are funny if you think, you know, kind of take the serious look off your face. Um, when you read them, and, you know, and one of the funniest statements, I think, in all Scripture is, you know, Yeshua I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Right? So even the demons know our reputation. They know our name. And so the angels know too. You know, and we might be calling, you know, oh, help me, help me, send your angels and help me. And the angels might be standing there going, Yeshua I know, Paul I know, but who are you? You're a person who, who never obeys. You're a person who rebels against the commandments, or you're a person who tries to commandeer the commandments and serve yourself instead of others with them, and you try to bring the glory to yourself. 
and not give the glory to the Father. So I don't know who you are. Let's, uh, let's go back. I know we've read this several times within the series, but I think it's such a foundational text. You know, if I had to pick one text that would define this whole series of Spirit-Filled Family, it would be 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, especially verses 1 through 7, because in terms of those seven spirits, it is so specific with us in terms of guidance and how to engage a marriage. And in the last program, we were really specifically talking about a marriage and perfect submission to the Father, a marriage where the couple, both the, the husband and the wife, um, they are walking a walk of righteousness, not a walk of perfection. None of us is perfect, but walking a walk of righteousness, obeying the commandments um, with the help of the Holy Spirit. But that's the ideal. And we know that it's not always the ideal. When we've talked about unequal yoking and how sometimes you can think you're equally yoked and then something happens within a marriage Maybe a spouse comes to belief, or maybe a, a spouse falls away from a certain belief, but all of a sudden you find yourself unequally yoked. What do you do? Well, this foundational text, it covers this. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, it says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. In other words, it's just like with these angels. You know, they're observing what's going on here. You know, it's the same thing with your husband. If you know he's out from under Yeshua's authority, you may feel as though you have no obligation to be under his authority. But what is it saying here? They may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Now that implies a couple of things to me. He says chaste and respectful. I believe he means chaste in reference to the commandments. Pure in reference to the commandments, that written word. Do you obey the word? But... And he says, and respectful. How do you obey the word? Do you do it arrogantly? Do you make him feel as though he's not as good as you, that he's not as righteous as you, that he's not as holy as you? Well, you just go on out to the bar and I'll sit right here and read my Bible all night. Is that necessary? Because remember, respect is giving value to the other. It's in the attitude. I think Peter is saying right here, yes, go ahead and keep the commandments, but you don't need a hundred-piece band to play for you when you observe a commandment. I mean, do you want a, a soundtrack when you sit down to read your Bible in the mornings so that everybody in the house can notice how righteous you are and how faithful you are to read your Bible? I mean, what do we want? Do we want a drum roll when we roll out the kosher food? What, what are we expecting in return for keeping these commandments? What do you expect your husband to think as you're keeping, as you're obeying a commandment, are you doing it in a manner of respect? Not just toward the Holy One. Keeping the commandment is a respect to the Holy One. That is your right Adonai. But remember, there's two parts to your right Adonai. If you respect Him, then you respect people. You don't devalue people. You don't devalue your brother, much less devalue your husband, who could be one without you saying a word, because he simply senses that you have respect for him. It's in the way that you approach. It's in your behavior. It's the things you do and the attitude with which you do them. So yes, keep the Torah. He's not asking you here to transgress the Torah. No, he's saying it's what you're doing. It's you're winning them without a word. 
you're winning them by actually being the Torah, not just saying the Torah. Anybody can say it. I mean, we wouldn't even need a word for hypocrite. All right? But not everybody does what they say. So he's saying it's better to be someone who does rather than someone who says. Right? So he says, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. Do those things attract your husband? Does he like those things? Does he like to see his wife with her hair fixed, with pretty jewelry on, on in a pretty dress, all dressed up for a date, date night? Well, of course he does. So Peter's not telling women not to wear jewelry. He's not telling them not to wear a dress. He's not telling them not to braid their hair. That's not what he's saying here. That's ridiculous. What he's saying is, remember the physical versus the spiritual? He says, if you would do these things in the physical realm to please your husband, to show that you value him, I mean, you dress up for company, you dress up for special events, but you wouldn't dress up for your husband. I mean, if he sees you dress up for other things, but you wouldn't dress up for him, he's going to feel disrespected. So he said, if you do these sorts of things to elevate his value, to show him, I think you're important enough to dress up for. I want to make myself pretty because this is how I would treat any other person I valued. He says, if you would do that, then don't let it just be that. Let it be just as beautiful in the spiritual realm. Let it be just as beautiful on the inside. In other words, beautify the commandment. See, you can keep commandments before him, but it doesn't mean you're beautifying them, making them attractive. See, we can keep commandments and make them very unattractive to other people. The school of Shammai, one of the schools of the Pharisees, their specialty was making commandments unattractive. The school of Hillel, they tried to make the commandment more attractive. They tried to beautify it through mercy. It didn't mean they compromised the commandment. They did. In fact, you know, according to a lot of standards now, it's very rigid. But they tried their best to, to bring away an interpretation of the commandment and an application of the commandment to bring the more merciful, beautiful aspect of it, to beautify the earth with those commandments. Shammai, most of the time when Yeshua is talking to the Pharisees, it is definitely the school of Shammai because he's speaking to their specific doctrines that made it practically impossible for the average person to engage the commandments in what they said was the way to do it. And so he's saying, if you would adorn yourself... And you are like a little Torah. We're like a little book of the Torah, little book of the commandments. If you would beautify your physical body, then why not beautify your obedience to the commandments so that it actually becomes an attractive thing to him? See, if, if he dreads Erev Shabbat, why not beautify your observance of Erev Shabbat in such a way that he would be attracted to it? Because remember, Shabbat doesn't require you to leave out anything that's fun within the boundaries of the Torah. And I guarantee you there are some things within the boundary of the Torah that you can do with your spouse that would be very attractive to him. He would start looking forward to Friday night. If you knew how to beautify the commandment instead of using it as a hammer. And women, you know, Peter appears to say that women, we kind of have a special gift in that way. We know how to make something pretty. And if we know how to make ourselves pretty, why can't we beautify the commandments? That's one of the great contributions that I think we can bring even into the body of Messiah bring into our fellowships and our Bible studies and our congregations. Men are more about that discipline of the Torah, and it's not always attractive. But a woman can come in there and she can beautify 
the commandment? Who usually decorates a congregation? Who's usually interested in when you walk into the room that you have a nice feeling? You can actually begin to feel the holiness of the day, the holiness of the fellowship, the holiness of the body, because she's done things in the physical realm to arouse you to the sense that something spiritual is happening here. That's a special gift that Peter is saying you can... You can beautify these commandments, and if you have an unbelieving husband or one who has fallen into sin, maybe at one time, you know, he was walking in the Word, but he has fallen at some point. What can you do? Make the commandment as attractive as you make yourself. And if you don't have a habit of making yourself attractive for your husband, that might be a clue, too. Um, You know, you might have to wear sweatpants a few days out of the week, but on Shabbat, make sure he understands that dressing up is not just dressing up for the sake of the holy day, but that he is part of that holy day with you. That you want to be attractive to him. You want to beautify those commandments for him. He says, let it be, and this is indicative, he says, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. In other words, he's saying, you know, men tend to get together and scream and yell and carry on about the interpretation of a passage in the Torah or a certain commandment. I mean, walk into any yeshiva, and it's not quiet. They're sitting there arguing over what this means is part of the study method. It's not necessarily a negative thing. It's what they do. But for the female, it's much more attractive to her. It says the hidden person of the heart, gentle, a quiet spirit. That's precious in the sight of God because our goal is not to be just like a man in relation to the commandments. See, When a man teaches the commandments, he has a much more powerful delivery. But when you hear a woman teach the commandments, it talks about, you know, the discipline of your father. But it also talks about the Torah of your mother because she delivers it in a much more compassionate, beautiful way. She beautifies the teaching of the commandments. You know, the power versus the beauty. And you put both of those things together and you've got a balance. You actually understand the the commandment. It's an absolute boundary. You get the discipline of the Torah from the Father. But you get the beauty and the pleasure of the commandment from the mother. And so if that is your unique gift and ability as a female to beautify the commandment, in your marriage, then you have to go back to what Paul said to the Corinthians. Don't cross-dress. Now, it doesn't mean that a woman can't speak the word powerfully. She can. But that's, that's something that's even going to come out of that gentle and quiet spirit. Women typically are not pulpit pounders. And so what Peter is saying... If that is your gift to beautify the commandment, then beautify that for your husband. Don't try to hammer him into submission to the commandments. That's not going to work for you because that's not your role. That's like putting on a man's garment. right? Instead, he says, let it be the hidden person of the heart. Let it see him is coming out of your heart that you have a joy, that you have a love of the Shabbat. Get him started on Shabbat. There's so many opportunities with Shabbat. You know, if there's nothing else in the commandments, you know, if he's a little put off by this kosher eating thing, you know what, you should be figuring out how to make the best kosher food you can possibly generate for Shabbat so that he looks forward to it and he doesn't see eating kosher as a drawback, but my goodness, what will she come up with on this Shabbat? This stuff is good. This is the best food I've ever put in my mouth. You know what? She's in her best mood of the week on Friday night. You know what? Kind of all day on Saturday. You know what? 
She's really easy to get along with during Shabbat. See, all the things that he values, if you can transfer those things to the commandments and your observance of the commandments on Shabbat, beautify it for him. Let him know he's valued. If he doesn't want to study with you, don't nag. Express, hey, I want you to study with me. I want you to to go through the Torah portion with me and, and talk with me about it. And if he can't take the whole Torah portion, take a paragraph, take a verse. If he will engage with you for five minutes in a positive atmosphere, that's better than demanding that you go through the whole Torah portion with me or you're just unrighteous and you're unholy and you're just going to go watch that, that wicked football game instead of worshiping God on Shabbat. That's not your gift. Your gift is to beautify those commandments. And if he will learn one commandment with you on Shabbat, or even you can bring it up over that wonderful meal. Remember what Queen Esther did? She set him up. Remember? with fun, with pleasure, with a party. Not starting an argument, starting a party. Start a party with them on Friday night. And if you can bring up one verse out of the Torah portion over that meal, I mean, you don't have to pick up the big five-pound art scroll to knock and start reading. You should already know what's in there anyway, if you're studying. Bring up some theme from that Torah portion and bring it up as a subject of discussion. So, you know, I was reading our Torah portion this week and, you know, Moses said to the people this, and what do you think about that? Show that his opinion is valued. No, he's not on the same plane as you in terms of his seeking after the commandments, but it doesn't mean he won't be. That's what Peter is saying. If... If you will beautify the commandment for him, then he will feel that sense of value because it says he's watching your chaste behavior and respectful. Keeping the commandments disrespectfully is not keeping the commandments at all. There's no profit in it, and you're not going to see any profit in your marriage. But be a lady with the commandments and see if he won't eventually want to be a man in the commandments. See you after the break. Shalom guys, this is Matthew Vandrells over at Hebraic Roots Network. Guys, we continue broadcasting these teachings of Yeshua of Torah to all nations by support by viewers like you. We'd ask you, if you currently do not support HRN, prayerfully consider sending us a one-time donation or maybe even a monthly donation uh, to HRN so we can continue supporting the nations with the gospel of Yeshua. It's up to you guys. It's up to you to keep this message going, and we thank you for that. Shalom. Welcome back. Let's continue. Let's finish out this this passage again uh, from 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, Remember, it says, let it be the hidden person of the heart. And it talks about a gentle and a quiet spirit. So we're talking here about the Holy Spirit. When you're engaging these commandments, let it be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if it's only at a physical level, that will be no attraction. I mean, that's not even, forget it not being attractive to your husband. It won't be attractive to anybody. I mean, you'll be an ugly person. People who keep commandments only at the physical level are keeping them for self-service, not for the service of the Father, and not to serve others. And it becomes very ugly. Their commandment keeping becomes odious. And so I said, be a lady with the commandments and see if that doesn't become attractive to him. It says, for in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, that voluntary cooperation Uh, Sarah is held up here as an example. I mean, I believe Sarah was a real lady. She might have been living like a Bedouin. She might have been living in goat hair tents, which they stink, by the way. She might have been living a rough life. But when you think the age she was when Pharaoh and Avimelech still found her beautiful, very attractive, I mean, 
She's a beautiful woman. It tells me she knew how to beautify the commandments. The, the statutes of Adonai that she and Abraham learned, she beautified them, and therefore even externally, she was attracting men at a, a pretty ripe age. Why? Because it says they hoped in God. And this is how they adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. All right? A voluntary cooperator. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. What is that? It's a title of respect. It didn't mean that she was worshiping him as a god. It meant that she was giving him that elevation, that respect. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. In other words, you can't render him fear, terror, in place of respect. You can't be terrified of your husband or it's still not going to work. You husbands, okay, what if the roles are reversed? What if it's the wife who is an unbeliever? Well, it, it kind of says the same thing, but it emphasizes, whereas with wives, he's emphasizing the spirit of reverence or respect, just as we studied in the spirit-filled husbands, he's going to emphasize the spirit of da'at or sacrificial love. It says, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. That's a bad translation. Um, if you go back into the actual meaning of that word, whether you're looking at it in the Greek or even in the Aramaic from the Peshitta, it's going to be related to da'at. He's talking here about the spirit of reverence for women, but the spirit of da'at, which is sacrificial love, intimate knowing, the love of experience that's born out of experience. Live with your wives. Another translation is better. It says, according to knowledge. Knowledge more closely aligns. Understanding actually means separation. So it's uh, the English is getting in the way. It's not the translators. It's, it's actually the trying to move from Hebrew to an equivalent concept in English. Live with your wives, I'm going to say according to knowledge, sacrificially, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, even though this is addressed to the men, and we had a little bit to say to the men concerning this verse that maybe was had a little bit different point to it, it's emphasizing something that's important as it connects to what we've said to wives about beautifying the commandments. With a man, the way that he is going to beautify the commandments for his wife, it says is to basically, he's reinforcing, it's the spirit of sacrificial love, da'at. Knowing someone intimately, it goes back there again. It's their way of rendering value to their wives. We render value to our husbands by exhibiting respect. They exhibit value toward the wife by doing things that exhibit sacrificial love. And part of that sacrificial love, as we saw in Exodus 24.10, is giving her time. Giving her of himself. cultivating intimacy within the marriage, not so much in the physical sense because that's less important to her, but cultivating intimacy with her in the spirit realm and in the realm of the nefesh, in the realm of the soul, emotion, investing in that part of their relationship. It's not, it's not that natural for him. That's why we're being given things that don't necessarily come naturally. All right, But when we function in it, we truly are walking in the fullness of, of what we were given in the garden. We were given the potential. Men were given the potential 
to live with their wives sacrificially. And when they do that, you have no idea what a woman would do for you. When she feels as though she is valued and loved, and you would defend her to your death, it's not just lip service, but when you give her of yourself, when you talk to her about your feelings, about your deepest thoughts, when you reveal that inner flesh to her, that's what it's calling husbands to right here. The same thing it says in Exodus 24.10. Really begin to give of yourself to remind her that you're still one and she is still valued. Each of the unbelievers in this equation, according to Peter, is being given a sense of value by the believing spouse. And he says, if you can do that, then your prayers will not be hindered. Because if you're writing your spouse out of the equation, and in this case, perhaps, the reason you're writing them out of the equation is because they're an unbeliever. They're not really walking in the commandments. And so you devalue their opinion. And it's not just that you devalue their opinion, say, on what a, a Torah portion is saying. You begin to devalue them in other areas. And they begin to sense the drop in your esteem for them. And they'll react to that, and, and that'll create a real wedge. You'll start to see the fractures in the relationship. But if in spite of what they believe about the commandments, and, see, and we're still not saying that we should violate the commandments ourselves in order to come into unity with the spouse, we should not. There is no condition, you know, unless it's a, they say the, the commandment to preserve life exceeds all others. All other things being equal, we're not taking it to an extreme example like that, but if someone is asking you to violate a commandment, then you're not required to do that. You're required to refuse respectfully. And so when they see that you can do that, that's going to make a difference. When he says he's, it says, it goes on to say, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir. Here again, Peter is saying the same thing that Paul is. He's pointing out the difference in the genders. He's saying physically she's weaker. Therefore, show her honor. Give her value. Do you understand how out of the time period that statement is? Women weren't valued and honored. They were property. That was the value that they had in the culture of the first century. In the economic picture of the first century, they ultimately were property. They would move from the possession of one man to the possession of another man through a marriage contract, through selling into slavery, servanthood, and so forth. And so what Peter is saying here, yes, she's physically weaker, and we tend to focus on what is evident in the physical realm. And we look at something that is weaker and we devalue it. We don't read into that weaker thing that there's something actually stronger there in some other area. And, and again, this is a very Jewish viewpoint because in the Jewish tradition, women are more spiritually in tune than men. That's why they, they put greater requirements on men in terms of observance. And it's um, sometimes it has the opposite effect. It does make women feel devalued in spiritual life, but that's a problem they'll have to deal with. As it concerns our issues, it says, if you don't honor her, even though she's physically weaker, and acknowledge that in Messiah, in the spirit realm you are, that she has gifts that go into the other side of that yoke with you. If you can't do that, if you can't elevate her value and look beyond the mere physical, then your prayers will be hindered. So what? how are you really helping yourself by putting all the spiritual responsibility upon yourself and devaluing her and saying she has nothing to render here but producing children and keeping the home? 
He says, no, value her spiritual contribution. That might be a role she operates in within her culture and gender and so forth, but it's just as important in terms of reaching your goals. And especially in this culture, in this time, in this uh, economic reality of women as property, if a believing husband begins to render value to that unbelieving wife and say, hey, you, you can be my equal spiritually. You know, in this Messiah that I have learned of, in this Yeshua, we see that he very much treated women as equals in spiritual things. He was clear. This woman did a good thing by cooking for my disciples, but this woman did a better thing by learning with my disciples, by being a disciple. That could be a real encouragement in that day and time when, you know, uh, I don't know that a wife was even a second-class citizen in some cultures. Uh, so this really is revolutionary in terms of, you know, some of the things that Peter and Paul are writing and some of the things that Yeshua did and said. Um, it would have turned, you know, the world on its end. Um, if you think about what the custom and the belief, the practice was of the day. Um, and so Peter, again, in that foundational text, he's addressing the authority structure of the marriage. And he's drawing up, drawing uh, Sarah as that example, I mean, the true lady of the commandments, beautifying the commandments. And we know that she could beautify them because she understood levels of respect and how to make Abraham feel valued. She called him Adoni, my Lord. And Peter says this is an example of the chaste and respectful behavior for wives to imitate. You know, um, we're going to disagree. We're going to have times when somebody hurts our feelings and it's going to be really easy to start that name calling. Remember, that's one thing we said to the husbands, never call your wife names because you're calling something on her in spiritual realms and you're not going to be really happy when she starts living up to that name. You're calling on yourself a curse when you do that. Well, we can see in this example that Peter's kind of saying the same thing not so much in a negative way, but in a positive way, saying, you know, names of respect that we might have for our husbands, you know, for you it might be sweetie pie, you know, it might be honey, it might be huggy bear, who knows. But a title for him that, you know, in your happy moments, maybe in your intimate moments, in your times of comforting, whatever your relationship calls for, you can call that name on him and he knows he's valued. That you have respect for him as a person, that he, he is of a value in your life and you appreciate him. Peter says that's an example. Call good things upon your husband. That's a sign of respect for us to imitate from Sarah. And the purpose of that behavior is not just to draw the husband closer to the word of Adonai, like Peter is saying, but to draw the whole family, because children watch, and they imitate our behavior. And so what the wife is doing in this case is she's modeling the spirit of reverence. She's modeling the thing that she wants to see in her children. She's modeling the thing that she wants to see in her husband. Because remember, even though Peter is pointing out work on this or work on this, work on this for the husbands, work on this for the wives. They're all the same spirit. This is one Holy Spirit. It just manifests itself in different ways. And so he's not saying to wives, don't worry about the spirit of da'at. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying, you might need to work a little harder right here. And he's not saying to husbands, you don't need the spirit of reverence. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, you might need to work a little harder over here on sacrificial love. All right. Um, 
that modeling behavior, in this case he's using the wife as an example of the person who can model the behavior she wants to see in other people. Obviously both uh, father and mother are going to model behavior. Um, you'll even model gender behavior. Sometimes you're just modeling human behaviors, you know, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, gratitude, those are human behaviors. But even with the husband, he's going to model male-type behaviors to his sons, and the wife is going to model female-type behaviors to her daughters. Right? So there's certain behaviors that transcend gender, like we say the human behaviors of the spirit, and if she starts modeling those behaviors before her family, before the unbelieving husband, she really doesn't have to say a, th a thing because there is a, a kind of phenomenon that applies to human beings, and it actually has to do with holiness, believe it or not. Um, I call it the monkey principle because we have as human beings a tendency to imitate. And when I say it's a monkey principle, kadosh, which means holy, and it goes back to Adonai says, you be holy because I'm holy. He doesn't say really why other than because I am. And so that's what Yeshua said. Whatever he says, that's what I say. Okay, as human beings, whatever we hear him say in his word, that's what we say. So we're kind of monkeying, we're mirroring his words what desirable behavior is from his word. So we are monkeying it. Why do I say monkey instead of mirror? It's just a, a word clue because the first letter of kadosh is kuf, which is a monkey. And so it's the monkey principle. For instance, if you're at the grocery store and you're checking out and the cashier looks like, you know, she's on her last nerve, if you can catch her eye and give her a big smile, there's a really good likelihood she'll smile back, regardless of the frown that was on her face a second before. Um, what do we do with babies? We make funny faces. We're trying to get them to imitate us. What do we do when we sing those silly little songs with the alphabet? Um, I know when I was teaching some boys the olive bait, I realized that they were actually learning easier when I would use the letter as its actual meaning you know, like a door for a dalit or pe. Uh, when I wanted to teach them, like mouth, pe, ayin, rosh, right? So we would do these little motions, and they learned much faster when we actually did something that they could mirror. So when we would practice the letters, we would end up doing things like this, and they would monkey or they would mirror the motions while they learned the letters. It's just a phenomenon of human psychology. Smile at someone, they'll smile back. Yawn, everybody else in the room is going to yawn. We mirror behaviors. Even Adam, he's made in the image of Elohim. So he will tend to imitate what he sees and what he hears. And so if the unbelieving husband observes the behavior of the wife, who is full of that Holy Spirit of reverence, he may actually begin to reflect what he's seeing and hearing. If she's becoming progressively more respectful and gentle in the way that she speaks to him, he may actually ratchet down some defensive behaviors and start monkeying, mirroring back, more respectful speech, more respectful behavior, um, you know, instead of conversations maybe filled with bad names and just, you know, instead of calling him a jerk, what if you found a way to render value and if nothing else, just keep your mouth shut rather than naming names upon them that they will feel compelled to live up to. Um, so that's the possibility. As he sees and hears that reverence, according to Peter, there's a possibility and maybe even a great possibility 
that he will eventually start to mirror that meek and that quiet spirit. And see, chiastically, if he starts mirroring, if you start increasing in the spirit of wisdom and exhibiting those respectful behaviors and behaviors that render value to him and say, you're important, thank you, I appreciate that, what you realize is that chiastically, again, that spirit of reverence is related to the spirit of wisdom. It's where you separate light and darkness. And see, both of these are necessary. If you truly want to begin to separate light and darkness in his mind, if you want him to be able to separate out the light of the Torah from the darkness of light apart from the Torah, then Peter is saying it begins right here. You start operating in that spirit of reverence and respect, which means it's an attitude of humility, then it may very well lead to him to a spirit of wisdom where he can begin to separate the light of the Torah from the darkness of life without it. And, you know, that modeling that behavior of holiness, of meekness, um, what he's doing, he's actually seeing it in action, not words. And for a lot of men, that's more important. What they see you do is way more important than what they hear you say. They're more likely to tune out what you're saying than tune out what you're doing. And so what he may never accept in words, he might accept in your deeds. You know, and like I say, these are not absolutes. This might also apply to a lot of women. Um, I don't tend to put much emphasis on what people say because they'll say one thing and do another. But I'll watch you over time. I'll evaluate your behavior over time. And if your behaviors are consistent with what comes out of your mouth, then your estimation in terms of your dependability, it just starts rising. You know, some people, they depend more on the spoken word. If somebody said it, it must be true. You, you really do have to give people time. Because some people will just say it with good intentions, but they don't really consider, they don't have the means to carry out what they say. They mean it well, but it ends up being taken as being deceitful. Um, and when somebody doesn't follow through on their word, then they become devalued. Because that's, that's kind of reaping what you sow. If you tell someone you'll do something and then you don't do it, you say, you're not valuable enough for me to do that. Right? And they in turn are going to devalue you because now your word's empty. Um, action in the male mind is very important. If you look at the Exodus text, I um, can't remember the chapter and verse right now, it's in Exodus, concerning the manna where um, it's talking about um, collecting twice as much. They're supposed to collect twice as much manna uh, the day before Shabbat on the sixth day. And um, it's actually the, the man, the Ish, who's commanded twice to quit gathering manna on Shabbat after he's already been commanded not to. You were supposed to get twice as much on the sixth day but then the man goes out and he's gathering on Shabbat after he's told not to. It's hard for him to cease from that work. Remember that force, that powerful drive that we said pushes him to fulfill those commandments of 2410. And so this particular man, he continues to try to collect on Shabbat. And in Exodus 16, 29, I think, it says, How long will you refuse to observe my commandments in my Torah? See, yod heh vav -He has given you the Shabbat. He's provided it for you. And when a wife reverences her unbelieving husband, even an unbelieving husband, she is demonstrating to him how to reverence Adonai and to keep his commandments so that eventually he will quit gathering on Shabbat. She's helping to cover that family 
while she's waiting for the Holy Spirit to work in his heart. Although she's not to transgress the Torah herself, she can beautify those commandments of the Torah so that they become as attractive to him as she is in a physical realm. She is to be responsive to her husband to the best of her ability. And that's, you know, the beauty of her creation as a female, that she can beautify the commandments. She can beautify the Torah and draw not just maybe an unbelieving husband, but an unbelieving anybody, co-worker, family, or whoever. So ladies, I'll say it again. Be a lady of the commandments.